Hello, my name is Alex Krieger. I'm a research professor at the Graduate School of Design at Harvard. I've been on the faculty for, uh, well, for a long time, for over four decades. For many years, I've offered a tour of Boston for people arriving uh, to the Graduate School of Design often, of course, from very far away. And the tour is not so much of a kind of a tourist's view of Boston. Uh, it's actually through a, a series of places uh, that have been key to the growth of Boston. Boston is unusual in that the original settlement was virtually on an island, and therefore it could only grow by making land, by filling the harbor to make land both for industry as well as for dwelling. At the moment, we are standing at the edge of East Boston on a rebuilt pier, and we're here because this offers the most spectacular view of downtown Boston behind me, where all those skyscrapers are. Where the tall buildings are was originally the Shawmut Peninsula. That's when Boston was first settled in 1630. The Shawmut Peninsula itself was island-like. It had a very narrow connection to the mainland that sometimes during storms and high tide was impassable. So there were moments when indeed Boston was island-like. By the way, East Boston also was once five islands that over the years were consolidated as it became a major sort of shipping center during the last part of the 18th and throughout the 19th century. If I can point to this odd pavilion to my left, it is in memory of Donald McKay, a very important individual who, during much of the 19th century, operated a major shipping enterprise. He was sort of inventor of the so-called clipper ship. And by the way, you might hear a noise behind me. We're also quite close to the airport, which itself was uh, filled in, starting in the 1920s, adjacent to East Boston. One of the odd things about East Boston is that people hardly ever come here because when they arrive in East Boston on an airplane they get sort of tucked in a tunnel to get to Boston and they miss where we are standing right now. East Boston was a major shipping center as I've said thanks to Mr. McKay and others. It has always been one of the great arrival points for immigrants, uh, Irish in the 19th century, Russian Jews at the end of the 19th century, many others and in the last several decades a lot of people from Central and South America as well. It still is perceived to be a kind of a more sort of affordable place. Very few places in Boston these days are affordable. But because it was always across the harbor, it always seemed a little bit distant. Now if I turn and point through the pavilion, you can see some very new housing. So finally, it's being kind of rediscovered. And unfortunately, it's becoming a bit gentrified. And that's an issue in itself relative to those who arrive here thinking they would find more affordable housing. And more of that housing is certainly going to come to fill in some of these other sort of decrepit piers that you might see. So that's the story of East Boston, but if I turn around and as you see the skyscrapers, that's the sort of our downtown area. Now if I can point you to where the skyscrapers diminish in size slightly and there are two lower buildings, both of which have a darker curtain wall. And there's a gap between them and that gap is a narrow body of water called Four Point Channel. Now everything to the left of that gap, everything as far as the eye can see, all the way past those Star Wars-like contraptions, which are a part of remaining industrial maritime facilities, and even further there, you can see a little hill. All of this land was filled in, almost a thousand acres. It actually began to create a connection between Boston and South Boston, and so this landfill was initiated to create a modern port for the city of Boston. However, it took several decades, and by the time it was completed, much of the shipping industries of Boston had sort of shifted to other parts, to more modern ports. So oddly, all this land, which now looks you know, fairly filled in and developed, lay empty for much of the 20th century. It was uh, just repositories for parking and some military installations and so forth, but essentially empty. It was not until about 20 years ago when a highway expansion project was begun that would create a new tunnel underneath the harbor to the airport and points north. All of a sudden this was sort of discovered by you know, developers and investors. It's had many names over the centuries. Uh, Commonwealth Flats used to be called because they were sort of flats, low-lying tidelands and so forth, not very easily to navigate. One of the other reasons for filling in land in Boston was to make it possible to navigate it properly to avoid lowlands. And so Conroe Flats is now called the Boston's Seaport Innovation District. 
and we will next go across the harbor back to the Shaman Peninsula, but we'll land next in that innovation district to offer a perspective from there about how it evolved and look back to East Boston as well. We're now standing in the middle of the Seaport Innovation District, and it's kind of exciting, and it's very new, and it seems to have a little bit of uh, activities on the streets and pedestrians and a mixture of uses, mostly sort of office buildings for sort of tech workers, but some an increasing number of housing, although quite unaffordable housing and so forth. So on the one hand, it's kind of exciting. It's been designated as the expansion of the downtown, Critics, however, look around and say it seems to lack some of the character of ye old Boston and maybe looks more like downtown Dallas, Texas, rather than what we think of Boston, at least if you look across its several histories. But nonetheless, it's an important area, and it is part of a thousand acres of land that was filled in towards the end of the 19th century and through the first decade of the 20th century to, in fact, make a new port because the old port, the old docks and wharfs, both in East Boston as well as in the central part of the Sean Peninsula, became to be thought of as being too small to accommodate modern ships on the one hand, and also they had no access to rail. That was a big problem because, in fact, as we move into the latter part of the 19th century and 20th century, if there's no connection between rail and ships, you don't have a very good logistical system of things arriving and being distributed. So towards the end of the 19th century, and even after some other substantial landfills had been completed, for example, the Back Bay, one of the most beautiful and upscale neighborhoods, it's called the Back Bay because it's the Back Bay of the Charles River. So this was actually even larger than the Back Bay. And it was designed to then create a modern port where indeed modern ships and rail could interact. Now the trouble was that by the time Boston got around to doing all of this, and of course the several decades involved in filling in such a large part of the tidal flats of the South Boston Peninsula, well, most of the maritime economy in Boston went away because indeed there are many other ports on the eastern seaboard that had already a much better connection between rail and seafaring activities. So we're standing in this sort of bustling 21st century urban environment which was largely vacant for a hundred years. As it became filled in, there was no need to produce a substantial number of maritime buildings and other functions there because that industry was no longer very active in Boston. And so it stayed empty and you see historic images of it being essentially a place for secondary uses, a place for parking. It was for many decades a great repository of cheap parking for the downtown, which was not really so far away across one of the channels that was still maintained. It was done about 20 years ago when the city went through a kind of a major need to redo its highway infrastructure, replay, actually enlarge a highway that was built in the 50s to support the downtown, although its actual function was to kind of help people escape the suburbs. It needed to be expanded, actually. It was an above-ground structure, and so the decision was made to widen it by burying it, therefore also eliminating this very unattractive feature, and also to create an additional tunnel across the harbor to the airport, an extension of Interstate 90, which gets you from Boston to Seattle without a stoplight. And so this was a great bottleneck when I-90 sort of crashed into downtown Boston and went through an older tunnel to the airport and points north. So the big project was to then extend I-90 through this part of the seaport and to make a new connection to Logan Airport. By this time, of course, a major international airport. So guess what? So all of a sudden, this area, which had been looked as to be kind of far away from the downtown and kind of useless, all of a sudden was much closer to the airport than the downtown. So all of a sudden, a tremendous amount of investors began to appreciate the benefits of being able to build here rather than to try with great difficulty to further densify the downtown area, it's self-constrained due to land or to move further out into the suburbs and so forth. So actually it was the kind of reconstruction of a highway system, best known internationally by burying a portion of it to create a kind of a long sort of linear park system, but in this case, creating a connection to a place with a major highway interchange to the airport, wow. All of a sudden, what a great place to build stuff. And so having stayed empty for many, many decades, within the past two decades, 
it has become the most desired parts of Boston, actually of New England, to build facilities for post-industrial economies and also for housing as well, at least more recently. The one more thing is that's quite significant is we're studying in Cambridge here, which is a separate city across the Charles River from Boston. So even though we're part of a continuous sort of metropolitan region and our economies are intertwined and so forth, actually cities also compete with each other. So as it became clear that this was a sort of major new expansion area for downtown Boston, it also became an opportunity to try to attract some of the high-tech biomedical industries that were clustering around MIT in Kendall Square to come to Boston. And that's why a few years ago, the name of it changed from Commonwealth Flats or the Seaport District to then the Innovation District. And so it has been relatively successful in trying to also take advantage of the great pull that Boston has nationally, even internationally, to attract high-tech and especially biomedical industries and provide another spot for that industry to grow in addition to, of course, the great success that MIT has experienced in the Kendall Square area. So we are now moving further eastward from this innovation district or from historically Conrad Flats area of Boston in a sense sort of closer to the South Boston Peninsula where we will be next. But this is an important point in understanding kind of the wrestling of history versus the future that cities like Boston are involved with. So we're standing next to what was once the largest building in the world until the Pentagon was built. And indeed, this also was a warehouse for the army. So on the eastern portions of the former Conrad Flats that were filled in, using some of the empty land that I described a few minutes ago, was a series of Navy facilities and Army facilities, and this warehouse was the center of it. It now is called the Design Center, interestingly enough, and it attracts various interior design showrooms and also now increasingly architects' offices and interior designer offices and so forth. It is also connected to our cruise ship terminal, and this is hardly a city that can compete with Miami in terms of cruise ships, but a fair number do come in, oftentimes from Europe, perhaps on their way uh, further south. So we're technically, we're standing in the Marine Industrial Park, although it is also quickly transforming into being an extension of the Innovation District. And for many in Boston, this is a bit of a problem because there is tension between embracing the modern economy and the postmodern economies of places like Boston, but also trying to hold on to blue-collar jobs. And so this portion, as its name suggests, Marine Industrial Park. And of course, there's still a couple of dry dock facilities where boats are repaired, or at least one that's active, some that are not. There's various couple of fish processing facilities. We still are a great repository of the fishing industry, although most of the fish arrive by airplane rather than by boat. Uh, so there's tension here between trying to preserve opportunities for such industries, the sort of the return of the longshoremen, one would say, versus the pressure that's coming from the rest of the Seaport Innovation District to build more stuff for laboratories, for research, or the sort of captains of sort of modern industries. So this is why this is an important place to understand. And it's also the remnants of 19th century kind of industrial infrastructures there, including this building, which is quite fascinating, not to mention, of course, the dry dock facilities. And yet, this is where you can almost feel on a daily basis this transition from old economies to new economies and then some of the kind of resistance to that transition that still occurs for some that still feel as if we're losing too many of our blue collar jobs only for the creative classes that uh, seem to be so important to the future of Boston. From the Marine Industrial Park, we will now cross another narrow body of water another channel. Uh, it's called the Reserve Channel now. This actually denotes the end of that landfill that created the Innovation District, and we'll be crossing into the South Boston Peninsula. 
South Boston Peninsula, again, was almost like a separate environment because historically before the landfills was quite removed distance-wise from the Shoma Peninsula and emerged over the course of several centuries into a place largely for sort of Irish immigrants. And it was fairly stable in that way until recently. But we're moving here for two places. First, to something that is known as Castle Island, even though there's no castle on it, nor is it an island, the historically of course it was. What occurs here at the moment is actually a beautiful park environment, a place where it feels if you're actually on the Atlantic Ocean, which is hard to feel in many places in Boston because of all the landfills that seem to have kind of separated the city from feeling as if it's right on the great Atlantic Ocean. You could also have a sense of the archipelago of some 30 islands that sort of define the edge of the inner harbor and indeed are occasionally at the moment perceived as a potential solution to a sea level rise if there's a way at some point to perhaps connect them with a, some sort of a levee system and therefore help protect the harbor. Castle Island was one of those islands, but uh, way back, more or less at the same moment when the city of Boston was established, the British built a little fortification there. And that fortification, or the expansions of which over the course of centuries we're looking at right now, uh, has remained a fortification for many, many years, actually for many centuries. It was even reactivated during World War II when there was concern that German U-boats were patrolling the eastern coast of the United States. And for a while it was once again a military installation. During the British control of the New World, of New England, it was the center of military operations. And indeed, during the Revolutionary War, it was the center of the British forces that were trying to overcome the loyalists trying to uh, seek their independence from the British Empire. So it was an island. It was very much of an island, as you can see in historic imagery and even early 20th century photographs. It was connected to the South Boston Peninsula slowly and not very carefully because of these various landfill operations that were always continuously happening, but more precisely during the moment in Boston where our park system by Frederick Law Olmsted and his sons and colleagues was being pursued. So between around 1870 and Till the beginning of the 20th century, a substantial park system was built in Boston, surrounding it, going from harbor around the edge of the city and back to the harbor. And this was its completion. And so Castle Island, by that time, although becoming a fortification later on again briefly during World War II, was by that time simply just a recreational area. And it was connected to the mainland by the park system itself and the creation of several beaches to serve the South Boston community and so forth. So at the moment, it's actually a very beautiful place, great sort of pleasure because of the fact that these peninsulas were sort of separated by bodies of water. In the mindset of Bostonians, even today, it seems far away. And so people from Cambridge or downtown Boston or for some of the certainly western suburbs, they don't think of going to Castle Island and the Castle Island Park and beaches and so forth. It mostly has been the sort of haven for South Boston residents, but a beautiful place more people should experience because indeed this is probably the best place. If in East Boston some time ago we had the best view of downtown, this actually is the best public environment with which to understand that you are on the edge of the Atlantic Ocean. So from here, we will follow along the beaches, the eastern edge of South Boston, and head towards a hilltop, head towards something called Dorchester Heights, even though Dorchester now is a neighborhood even further south. Dorchester Heights is the uppermost topography of the South Boston Peninsula, and we're going there for two quite radically different reasons. We have climbed up the rather arduous climb up to the top of the South Boston Peninsula, an area called Dorchester Heights. It's an amazing spot. It's a perfect oval in plan if you were to kind of look down on it. You can see it's surrounded by two and family residences, typical of early part of the 20th century in Boston. It offers amazing views pretty much all around. Behind me, you see quite an interesting tower, and it commemorates a very important uh, moment in the Revolutionary War. Somehow, against all odds, and it's hard to imagine as we stand here, George Washington moved 1,200 troops and a fair amount of cannons and armaments to the top of this hill 
took command over the Boston Harbor where the British fleet was, and it caused the fleet to start to evacuate. So it was a very important transition point in the Revolutionary War. Now, Dorchester Heights is at the top of the South Boston Peninsula. And again, sort of behind me, you can see portions of the downtown and portions of where we were earlier, not just Castle Island, but all that land that was filled in to not make Castle Island an island anymore, the thousand acre landfill that would create a modern port that never took place but also happened to sort of connect the Shaman Peninsula and the South Boston Peninsula and whereas of course historically they seem to be very very far apart originally um, now they're sort of connected in various ways including through that large landfill. So that's one reason why we took a hike up here but we're also here for a less noble reason and it's to address uh, one of the problems that Boston has always had with race, even though, uh, uh, you know, at the moment it's considered a very sort of progressive, very liberal community, and it, and it is, and yet historically uh, there are a number of cases where that was not true. Behind the tower stands South Boston High School, and that high school was the scene of a variety of very traumatic racial incidents. In the 1970s, there was a decision to try to integrate the schools because they were so completely unintegrated. Well, the population of South Boston, largely Irish American, certainly white, were very opposed to this. And there are terrible scenes of school buses arriving with little kids fearing for their lives with hundreds of neighbors standing there shouting, no, go away, you don't belong here, and so forth, as they were escorted from the bus by police and even the National Guard at some point into the building to take classes. You cannot overlook the fact that historically, as in other places in America, a tremendous amount of discontent uh, took place here, sometimes taking kind of violent form. So with that now, we're going to sort of move back down from this hill and head over towards Columbia Point, where the University of Massachusetts campus is, where the Kennedy Library is, but we're there also for a different reason, not unrelated to the kind of racial injustice in Boston, to look at an old public housing project that was transformed to become a mixed-use neighborhood that has sort of won a lot of accolades for how you might try to transform public housing. So here we are, we're standing at a place where all kinds of quite very different things are taking place. Uh, we're standing on the campus of the University of Massachusetts Boston campus. We're standing very close to the Presidential Library in honor of John F. Kennedy, and more recently also a sort of a sister institution in honor of his brother, Edward Kennedy, now called the Institute for the Study of the Senate. And we also, as we kind of look around a bit further backwards towards the city, you can also see a housing project. And so the juxtaposition of these things themselves have an interesting history. By the way, very small portions of what is now Columbia Point was an interesting sort of pasture and actually some of the earliest colonists to Boston landed here, another place where you can sort of make your way through some shoals and mudflats and gain access to land. But still it was further sort of south and east of even South Boston, which is even further away from the Shama Peninsula. And so over time, it actually became more of a place to dump things. It became one of the kind of places where, of course, refuse was located. In fact, it had, and there's still kind of remnants of this, an amazing pumping station. It's a ruin now. You can see it. People still wish it could be preserved somehow. And was very innovative during the 19th century, being able to kind of whisk away refuse further out into the harbor. So for much of the 19th century, uh, the first half of the 20th century, it really was a kind of a dumping ground for garbage for Boston. And therefore, to accommodate uh, more garbage, the landfill around the pasture began to be filled in more and more. During the 1950s, it was selected to be the home, and think about this, this is a dumping ground, for the largest public housing project built in Boston for approximately 1,500 apartments. Of course, lower class people, largely, if not ultimately, eventually, almost entirely African American. So this is another kind of sad part of Boston's and the US history, but where would you put public housing? On a dumping ground quite far away and without much 
access to transit and so forth, although more recently one of our subway extensions has a station nearby. So in the 50s, it was devoted to the public housing project, which because, like many public housing projects, eventually sort of failed, partially because there's no access to shopping or other kind of facilities or amenities, and because it became the haven for crime and other social behavior and so forth as other public housing projects built under the urban renewal era in Boston's history. It became largely abandoned. By the end, only several hundred people lived there from the 1,500 apartment units that were built there. In the early 70s, the University of Massachusetts system thought it should have a Boston-based campus. And so a decision was made to locate a campus there, which here we are in the middle of it, and it's sort of thrived and grown over time. And so that was the second sort of a larger influx, and quite a different influx of people and activities into this area. And the third thing in kind of the late 70s was the arrival of the Presidential Kennedy Library. Now, this requires a bit of a story because the original decision by the Kennedy family, actually by John Kennedy's wish, was to locate it indeed in Harvard Square. It was to be located right where the Kennedy School of Government is right now. And indeed a major design took place of a sort of large complex. It was going to be a threefold design. The library, or the new School of Government named after Kennedy, and a park, again in honor of John F. Kennedy who liked when he was at Harvard to sit at the edge of the Charles River and sort of look outward. And for a number of years, with a design by Ian Pei that looked remarkably like the pyramid at the Louvre was being designed there, it received a tremendous amount of protest by the kind of good citizens of Brattle Street and other of the kind of more upscale neighborhoods to the west of Harvard Square of the university. And think about this. So in the kind of the late 60s, early 70s, the shock of the death of the Kennedy was still quite fresh. And so there's expectation, of course, that his presidential library would attract millions of people. And so there was this fear about Harvard Square being inundated with people going to the Kennedy Library and overwhelming the square. And after about seven or eight years of determined protests, even lawsuits and so forth through various redesigns, the Kennedy family finally chose to pull back, agree to build the Kennedy School of Government, which is still there, and the park, designed supposedly by Caroline Kennedy, including the selection of each of the trees in honor of her father. But a search began for where else might the library go, and at that time, the new University of Massachusetts campus and its chancellor say, hey, wait a minute, why don't you build it here? There's a potential for it for Boston to be like the Statue of Liberty, because Given the patterns of planes landing in Logan Airport, they kind of buzz over a portion of the Columbia Point, and it would be a little bit like flying over Boston's equivalent of the Statue of Liberty, in this case, the library in honor of John Kennedy. And so the Kennedy Library Organization agreed and built it there, as you can see. And it is a kind of an icon but it never has been quite as often visited as expectation. Of course, partially the history of the assassination is now kind of diminished in its kind of impact, but also because it still seems like it's kind of far away from most of the kind of more vital places of Boston. But nonetheless, here's a former you know, garbage collection that now houses three rather incredible environments. The third one being a former public housing project that was transformed in the early 80s, middle 80s, I guess, to be now a kind of one of the most impressive and nationally acclaimed mixed-use housing projects where some of the buildings were demolished, some of them were maintained and refurbished. The folks who were still there were given the opportunity to stay there in their approved housing. And because in the 80s, all of a sudden, waterfront housing became an interesting thing, became also quite suitable for market rate housing. And so a group of developers, development entity, acquired this really horrible remnant of a public housing project and transformed it into a mixed-use environment, which accommodates some lower-income people and a fair number of sort of middle-class individuals, families as well. 
So now let's take a walk along this incredible area of Boston called Columbia Point and experience the remarkable transformation that has occurred there over the course of a couple of centuries. So we're walking through the edge of the University of Massachusetts Boston campus. We are seeing now on the left the Kennedy Library. We're going to go past it along recently improved public walkway. You'll see on the left the ruin of this great pumping station that used to pump all the sewage out into the harbor. And ahead of us, as you can see, is the former Columbia Point public housing project now called the Harbor Apartments, a mixed-use environment that has become really known nationwide as an interesting way to combine affordable housing and market rate housing, and indeed was used as a model by the Department of Housing and Urban Development to try to also transform some of the other sort of failed public housing projects built during the renewal era. So think about this. Over the course of a few minutes, we've gone through a major university campus, two important national institutions, the Kennedy Library, and now the Center for the Study of the Senate in honor of John F. Kennedy's brother, Edward Kennedy, and into this now seemingly seamless sort of mixed-use housing project, again, a model for many others now across the country. Next, then, we will head back into the center of town and wind up on Long Wharf, more or less looking directly ahead to where we began, which was Pierce Park in East Boston. Well, we've just about come full circle to where we began this morning, except that we're on the other side of this body of water called Boston Harbor. We began the day at a park directly across the way, uh, behind a couple of these boats. We're standing at the end of Long Wharf, so-called because once it stretched out about a third of a mile into the harbor, and we're looking back at where we began at East Boston. If you pan around here, you can see sort of what has been happening recently. You can see all that housing that's being built. East Boston is finally being discovered as a good place to live, but of course also causing a little bit of gentrification problems for what was you know, lower middle class set of neighborhoods there. You kind of pan slightly to the right and you can see the airport uh, as well. And if we pan even further, you can see where we were earlier in the day, the so-called innovation district. And you can see the scale of the buildings that are being built there. And this was, as we've talked about earlier, that large landfill at the beginning of the 20th century, which stayed more or less fallow for most of the time, but has been recently rediscovered where many of the kind of life sciences and high tech companies have been moving to Boston. So again, we're standing at the end of something. So when I turn around and point back behind me, at the very end, you see a little building sort of protected by four giant skyscrapers. Not exactly what sort of preservationists would think of doing, but one of the great anomalies. It's sort of a beautiful situation where the sort of modern city creates a background for the old state house, the colonial state house prior to the revolution where the governor sat and so forth. But the reason for standing here and looking back to where we began is also to understand uh, in another way, the way in which the land expanded. The wharf was long because it went all the way from where we're standing right now, all the way to the front of that old state house. It's now a very short wharf, actually, as the city has continued to expand. And so one of the sort of, if you will, lessons of the day, I hope that you now appreciate, is how much Boston has been transformed by its constant need to create land, because, of course, originally it was settled virtually as an island, and the only way for it to grow, and actually the only way for it even to use the harbor, which was very shallow and full of mud flats and so forth, the only way to even navigate it is to kind of bring land further out into the harbor itself. So with that, I think I encourage you to now kind of explore downtown Boston and one of the great tourist areas that we avoided all day. Uh, you will walk past three sort of informational kiosks and I hope that you stand and explore them a little bit. They actually more or less tell the same story that we have been experiencing over the course of the day. Uh, they're actually called the Walk to the Sea. My firm actually had the pleasure of designing them. They step up the hill all the way to the State House. So if you think about that, it kind of conveys the history of Boston through this one walk from the top of Beacon Hill, the highest topographical area in Boston, and then it takes you down and over that path to where we're standing now, described the near 400 year history of Boston. So one fine day, you might also, uh, on your own, take the walk to the sea.